Okay, let's get started. So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Amity Foundation third party administrator listening session for re-envision youth after school and summer programs. Um, we will get started by introducing the team. Um, I will start. My name is Joanne Sanchez. I am the project director for third party administrator, and I will pass it over to Alan. Good afternoon, everyone. Alan Richards, Los Regional Administrator for Amity Foundation. And I'll pass it over to Carmen. Thank you, Alan. So sorry, you, everyone. everyone. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is the interpreter, but is it possible to do the uh, language instructions first so we can uh, read those, uh, do the introductions and interpret these simultaneously, please? Sure. Thank you. Carmen, will you go to the instructions? All righty, well, we want to... Um, first of all, let everyone know that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, the listening session is being recorded for the purpose of capturing information to be utilized later on in the process. Uh, the raised hand instructions. When accessing Zoom um, through a computer browser or smartphone, um, at the bottom tab, scroll down to reactions, and you will see a raised hand feature. When accessing Zoom through the smartphone browser, at the bottom tab, scroll to more. There's three buttons above more, and you will see a drop down menu with the raised hand feature. For telephone participation, for anyone experiencing online technical difficulties, telephone dial in information will also be provided in the chat. And during public comment, telephone participants may press star nine to raise your hand, and star six to unmute. Buenas tardes a todos. Vamos a dar las instrucciones uh, de cómo escuchar esta reunión en su idioma de preferencia. Para interpretación en español, haga clic en el icono del globo terráqueo, donde dice interpretación y seleccione español. Para interpretación, haga clic en eh, Bueno, en el español y eh, esta sesión se escucha, eh, se está grabando en el, con el propósito de capturar esta información. Ahora vamos a dar instrucciones como levantar la mano. Al acceder a Zoom a través de un navegador de computadora o la aplicación de Zoom de un teléfono inteligente, en la pestaña inferior desplácese hasta reacciones y ahí verá la función de levantar la mano. Al acceder a Zoom a través del navegador de un teléfono inteligente, en la pantalla inferior, desplácese a más o hasta más. Ahí debe, hacer, uh, debe haber tres botones eh, donde dicen más o more. Y verá un menú desplegable con la función levantar la mano. También se proporcionará en el chat. Eh, por el teléfono móvil, uh, de, no... Eh, no necesita identificación el participante o código de acceso. Simplemente presione eh, el número de gato ¿verdad? O, eh, cuando se le solicite. Y durante los comentarios públicos, los participantes te, telefónicos pueden presionar estrella 9 para levantar la mano y presione estrella 6 para dejar de, de silenciar. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Back to you. Thank you so much. So uh, we'll, we'll start introductions again. Uh, my name is Joanne Sanchez, uh, project director. Alec? Yes. Uh, Alan Richards, Los Angeles Regional Administrator. Carmen? Thank you, Alan. Good evening. Carmen Jacinto, CEO, Community-Based Projects for Amity Foundation. Rebecca? Hey everybody, Rebecca Gray. I'm the grant administrator for the third party administrator project for Amity Foundation. That leaves Wendy. <laughs> good, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendy Thompson. I work for Amity. I am the associate director of training and um, technical assistance. Thank you, Wendy. Um, so Amity Foundation has been selected as a third party administrator for the CFCI and non-CFCI funding opportunities. 
We wanted to create a space for the community to give feedback, insight, or recommendations um, in the subject area of re envisioned youth after school and summer programs. Next slide, Carmen. Thank you. Uh, question, we will begin with question number one. Um, again, please, if you would like to give comment, um, please uh, push the raise hand uh, button and you will be called in the order that you raised your hand. Uh, if you have any uh, comments uh, or recommendations that you would like to put in the chat, please feel free to also put them there. Thank you. Uh, question number one, when you think about the program area we're here to discuss today, what are the gaps in services that you know about in your community? And again, those subjects are re envisioned youth after school and summer programs and youth centers. What do you see as the gaps in services in your community? Yeah. Hey, y'all. Uh, good afternoon uh, or good evening. Um, so I think for me, one of the, the uh, or some of the major gaps in services right now um, are really focused in and dialed in on engaging disconnected youth at any age range, um, specifically uh, young folks who are transitioning out of high school, either college age and or you know, going into uh, the workforce for the first time, you know, going to like that 26 year old range, I think there should be an investment in drop in activities um, and, and an assurance that, you know, certain drop in activities and providing safe space doesn't always, you know, um, create this situation where you get all these numbers like one would in a traditional county funded program, right? But it's important to create safe spaces to be present in the community, to build community and then build the participant numbers in that sense. But drop-in programs, I think are something that's really important. In addition to looking at how some of this funding can really go to support some of the smaller community centers um, in the community that are really invested in doing the work, front loading these, these um, grants and these funds is one way of really ensuring that, um, you know, these smaller organizations and community centers, youth centers are able to provide uh, these services um, in a manner that allows them to not only be effective and have positive outcomes and impact, but also to build their capacity. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Jody. Yes, hello. I was um, going to say pretty much what he said. Um, the community-based organizations, specifically um, in the, the area that I serve, South LA, there is not enough programming for the youth for after school uh, for for any time at that matter, for, for that matter. I mean, there's not a, just a, not enough programs. Um, we have a community center but it's not funded. I get small grants here and there to do little small projects and things of that nature, but I'm struggling to keep the doors open, to keep the staff in there, to keep the programs running and things of that nature. So um, yeah, the funding, I don't see a lot of funding for community for community service-based uh, programs and things of that nature, so yeah. Thank you, Tony. Jessica? Thank you. Um, one of the things that we've experienced is uh, most after school programs that are on site and sanctioned by the school have very low tolerance for student behaviors that are rooted in trauma. And so kids who need it most are the kids who get kicked out of those programs. So really wanting to see the CFCI funding hold programming accountable to, to not just serve the easiest to serve kids, um, but to make sure they're reaching the kids who need this most. And uh, I agree with Tony, there's major equity issues in terms of where funding is available. Uh, so we also experience in uh, South LA and other parts of the Valley um, uh, where communities are low income, there's very little investment in 
use services. So it needs to be equity centered in terms of determining where the funds go. Um, and we need to see more culturally responsive programming for children. Um, and then also marketing to go with these programs. So what happens is there'll be great programs and families don't know about it because there's no marketing budget. So that's really important so that families know about them and can really connect to them. Thanks. Thank you, Jessica. Anna? Hi, uh, this is Anna. Uh, ditto pretty much on a lot of it. And what I find is um, kind of referring to what they've spoken about, we find that a lot of the grants or the funding that's available, they will only give to program. They never want to consider the general operating, which is all those areas that the um, my uh, the speakers that just that just spoke talk about, which is the way to keep the doors open, um, even for staffing, which to me is what programming is. It's the people that do the work. Um, so I find sometimes the um, the restrictions on what they're willing to fund is, um, is it hinders us from, from really being able to do the work that we're going to do at the level. Also, I find some of the programming now is very much intervention because there are some quick outcomes that can be reached. Uh, but I do believe with after school and summer programming, prevention and even long-term, uh, now that I've been in the community in almost 20 years, um, we may have to delay the outcomes a little bit, but prevention prevention is, is key to really move that needle in any of our communities and to keep that consistently um, available for funding and for use. I also find I'm in the East LA area. There's wait lists for all of the schools. And so the schools that get the most funding through ACES and 21st Century Learning have they don't go out of their way to find additional funding so they can host all the kids that are asking for services. So then anybody who ends up on the wait list starts coming to the programs of those of us that are the smaller organizations that either have to charge some level of fees or um, you know, we tend to be the ones that will take a child because they need us. And, um, but we don't have the funding a lot of times. So we're having to make a lot of concessions a lot of times, uh, but we are you know, doing the frontline work. And it's, um, I have noticed the county has tried to um, simplify the process, which I truly appreciate. And I thank everyone who's been at the forefront of doing that for some of the um, smaller organizations. Um, but I find that those that get the bigger money from the feds, from the state, uh, Prop 49, all of that, they do the least amount of, they're, they're the most stringent, the same way they will kick out a kid in two seconds flat. And so we take in a lot of the children that do have the, um, they, need the they need the services more. And we also are expected to be at a higher level of service because they do have uh, very difficult backgrounds and they need the most care and they need more trauma. So we also need a higher level of mental health support that is difficult when you're expected to have an MSW um, full salaried on site so that you can bring MSW interns to assist with the programming. So there needs to be some level in the mental health collaboration so that we can serve the kids uh, because they trust us. We send a kid to therapy and it can take six to nine months before they'll even trust their therapist. And they come back to us saying, well, I didn't say anything. I don't know them. And we're like, but that's why we sent you there, you know? So there needs to be more collaborating with all the uh, wraparound services, I do believe, with the smaller grassroots groups that are truly doing the work day in and day out with a lot of the families that um, aren't going to be served. That's it. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Derek? Hey, um, thanks for sharing that. And um, my name is Derek Gordon, and I am the program manager for Project Joy. So we are a nonprofit organization based out here in the Antelope Valley, and we provide uh, job readiness and outreach services uh, for youth and families. A lot of our demographics come from um, a foster background. Um, a lot of our families are homeless or victims of domestic violence. 
And uh, recently we collaborated with LA County on um, this initiative called ARDI, it's A-R-D-I, and that's uh, the Anti-Racism, Diversity and Inclusion uh, uh, Initiative. And so what we were doing is um, trying to bring uh, awareness of how to reduce uh, poverty to the community. And the way that we did that, we wanted like the community to really um, like be able to digest and comprehend these initiatives. So we allowed them to do poetry. So we had like a poetry on poverty session and through like this poetry, like uh, youth and like parents and everyone in general, they, they were able to like really express themselves. And we got a lot of feedback that the poetry was uh, therapeutic. Uh, speaking of like mental wellness, they said that um, it helped them express themselves and they would like to see a lot more like um, spoken words and poetry and journaling. So I think that there's um, a lane to, to focus in that area. Also, what, what I'm seeing um, just working in, in, in employment and finance and, and helping individuals uh, attain jobs, even college students, a lot of them don't have resumes or never even uh, created a resume. So I think if we could uh, implement that early on into the schools uh, with after school programs where it's uh, job readiness and learning how to create resumes, doing mock interviews and um, different life skills that could help uh, individuals uh, as soon as they graduate, they'll be able to attain um, positions in the job market, I think is uh, a really good way to, uh, to stop the cycle of poverty early on. And I thank everyone uh, for joining and contributing the ideas and thank uh, Amity Foundation also. Thank you, Derek. Rebecca? Thanks. Um, I'm going to read a comment from Jessica Ellis in the chat saying, yes, the youth centers in our high needs areas look so run down and that communicates to our kids, <clears throat> pardon me, that they are not valued. They need capacity funding for facilities and facility staff. There's important info to help make the case to invest in prevention, how to measure the impact and ensure further future investment in prevention and Jessica lists a link in the chat. If anyone has difficulty accessing that, you can chat me and I will send it to you directly. Jessica also says, need to fund restorative justice services to support youth centers facing serious behavior harms done by kids. In other words, property damage, assaults. So there can be repair of the harm without engaging police and without permanently excluding the youth, if that can be avoided. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Rebecca, for reading the comments. Uh, Shereen? Hi, good evening. I'm sorry, I joined a little late and I, I think we're gonna, we're focusing on the youth part of it, I believe. Um, I'm the executive director of Ronnie's House in Long Beach. And we serve the LA County area uh, by providing re-entry services. Uh, we just, one of the, the areas, and we do a lot of youth uh, programming. And one of the areas that I, I definitely see a huge need right now is mental health services and the connectivity of mental health services for our youth. The other one is, is uh, aggregating the resources. So one of the things that we just launched with the support of the Department of Mental Health in the county is a website that I'll share called Reentry Keys, which aggregated 4,800 resources for our justice impacted community, as well as our foster youth and their families. I think many organizations on here I see on the site. And I was at a youth commission meeting about a month ago, and they spoke about a possible RFP that they would put out, my apologies, a possible RFP that was focused on technology and creating a hub, and then they ended up passing on it. But the truth is the way that our youth are now today and the way that they're engaging, they're not gonna look for our services individually. It's important for us to create, which is something that we're now um, hoping that we can achieve and we're working on next, is to be able to aggregate all of the resources so that both youth can access them as well as service providers can work together uh, because it takes a collective, right? Whether it's justice impacted or our youth. So 
I definitely see that as a big gap and how we can um, integrate resources as service providers together and lift up sort of the work collectively as, as agencies. Uh, again, thank you so much for this conversation and for taking our input. Thank you. Rebecca? Rebecca, you're on mute. Thank you. Coach <laughs> uh, Bryant um, posted in the chat that there's an event happening in or for Antelope Valley providers. Uh, she's going to post it in the chat. Tony, I haven't seen the link appear. If you're having trouble, if you can let me know, maybe I can help you post it. That's all, thank you. It's not allowing me to attach the flyer, so can I send it to you, Wendy, um, or one of you and you can Yes, of course. Yes, Tony. And Sharon just posted a entry JPEG in the chat uh, that is downloadable. Thank you. Any other uh, comments about gaps in services? Please raise your hand or go ahead and put it in the chat. Okay, Carmen, can you go to the next slide, please? Question number two. Given the category we are discussing and the services we have been talking about, what changes in your community would mean that the services have been successful? What kind of changes do you need to see in your community to know that things that are implemented are being successful? Please raise your hand or you can put your comment in the chat. Rebecca? So, uh, Sharon posted in the chat that tomorrow her organization is hosting the state of reentry and a link where you can find out more information. Uh, there's also a JPEG uh, that she posted to the chat that you can download with information. Thank you, Anna. Hi, um, I think what we would see in our community, um, well, I think the, the direct correlation to everything from um, middle school, uh, their uh, culmination rate, uh, the high school graduation rate. Um, for us, it's uh, literacy, like at the third, fourth grade level to see if kids are at grade level by that stage. Uh, because that seems to be an indicator of uh, if they'll enter into middle school or if they will drop out of middle school. I think everything from, you know, the community's petty crime rates. Um, so, and just um, the overall engagement of the community, because we find when kids participate in these types of programs, they seem to be extremely participatory once they get to high school in youth leadership within their community. They get more involved in civic civic events, um, everything from less vaping. You know, for us, our biggest thing is kids um, just um, validating that they can use pot and they can use pot at whatever age they want. We're dealing with a lot of dispensary, illegal dispensary issues. And uh, that's a message that, that needs to be, um, they're very confused. And it's showing up in just how young they're starting to use the pot and the vaping. And so ideally, uh, by able to uh, really focus on their character and their values and their goal setting through what 
all of us do and all the different ways that we do it and keeping them safe and uh, less exposed to the negative and really teaching them how to say no to peer pressure. I think in general, all the stats that we look at to have a strong community will start moving to higher levels in the positive. Thank you, Anna. Rebecca? Uh, in the chat from Shireen, um, two observations. The violence would slow down. Data shows that investing in our youth decreases violence. In 2019 and 2020, gun violence was a leading cause of death in teens. Jessica Ellis says success. Kids are thriving and have the supports they need. And that will be evidenced by less mental health needs, more educational attainment, less justice involvement and better outcomes for youth in foster care and LGBTQ youth. Kids will be self-assured because their culture is valued and celebrated and they got to learn their history and were empowered to take action in their community. And it looks like Tony Bryant was able to post information about the event in the chat and that's a downloadable JPEG. Shireen says, they are using pot because of the mental health issues that need to be addressed. We need funding in school programs to provide mental health. And Laura Romero says, excellent points, Anna. Thank you, Rebecca. Derek? Yes, uh, this is Derek with uh, Project Joy again. And um, so in Los Angeles, uh, the uh, the percentage of disconnected youth is 24%. And that's like one of the highest in the nation. And I think if we see a reduction of disconnected youth, and when I say disconnected youth, that's uh, youth um, between the ages of 16 through 24, that they're not going to school, nor they're, um, they don't have a job. So I think if um, we see a reduction of that, and we could um, bring it down to at least around 10%, that, that'll um, show signs of success. Thank you. Thank you. In the chat, Shireen agrees with Derek. Great point, she said. Any other comments or feedback on question number two? Please raise your hand or put it in the chat. I think Adrian sent me a message instead of the whole group. Um, she said we should um, include more social emotion, emotional learning in our programs. Thank you. Jessica? This might be slightly off topic, but um, in addition to the services having been successful, evidence that the funding structure was successful would be that um, local folks with great talent who care about their community would have low barriers to access to provide um, services and supports to kids. So, you know, a guy in the community who's a great mentor and teaches baseball really well uh, is willing to dive into this he could get into it quickly and easily through this youth center. Um, there'd be proper supports in place, um, you know, for protecting kids. But right now, a lot of our services have so many barriers to entry for community members who care to get involved uh, to an excessive degree that's beyond liability issues. Rebecca? Thank you. Um, I'm going to, we, we have a short survey that captures all of these questions uh, in an electronic form. And I'm going to post the link 
in our chat. Um, so if you're having trouble participating today or you know someone who couldn't be here and would like to answer these questions, they can access the questions through this link and get their answers to us that way. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Carmen, will you go to the next question, please? Thank you. Question number three. We are seeking assistance in reaching as many organizations as possible. Do you have any suggestions on email this, communities, coalitions, or other places where we might be able to reach service providers? Um, you can raise your hand and give us this information, or you can also put this in the chat. In the chat, Jessica Ellis uh, has written, are you attending groups like Watts Gang Task Force? There's a similar group in the Westmont Corridor, et cetera. Laura Romero suggests LinkedIn. Turin says, we have 4,800 providers on our website. We have a newsletter that gets out to the community. We're happy to be a part of outreach. Uh, and there's a web address that I can share with the team. Anna says, I do believe most county supervisors have lists of their districts, nonprofits and spa activities. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to the next question. If you think of any convenings or coalitions or other places, uh, please feel free to put it in the chat. Thank you, John. Before we move on to the next question, there are two other comments in the chat. Okay. Uh, Jessica offers the 211 list um, for the phone service, the 211 number. And Sharon says, we also have a youth network in Long Beach. Thanks, both of you. Thank you. Question number four. Do you have any recommendations regarding how we might ensure equity throughout the funding application process and after the funding awards are made? Please raise your hand or put your comment in the chat. Sharin. Hi there. Um, this one I definitely think is so important because one of the things that um, I'm dedicated to is equity in contracting that we oftentimes um, miss the mark on because it's really the, the grassroots organizations to me that do the incredible work, but oftentimes don't have the funding. So one of my recommendations just in dealing with local procurement is to simplify the process. I re remember when the CARES Act funding came, we created a more simple, or the city did a more simple application. It still was able to assess us, our team, uh, our capabilities, and it was not complicated. We don't have to make it so complicated because that is one of the biggest barriers. Um, also, a lot of organizations contract people out and a lot of times the insurance requirements um, such as workers comp may not be available for some of the smaller agencies. Um, so that's something to look at, to look at waivers. I mean, we have it now, but there was a time we didn't because we weren't making enough to even you know, have W-2 employees and so be open for insurance waivers that could lessen what that looks like. 
and then have workshops on application process, which we also did that really, really helped us help local organizations and small businesses. Even right now, we're in that process over some local grants. I did a video, we did training. And so when you guys can do that, it really uh, makes them a lot more comfortable to be uh, able to apply. Thank you, Sharon. Rebecca? Jessica says in the chat, there are specific zip codes that are disproportionately represented in the youth jails and in foster care. Funding should absolutely go there first. Thank you, Jessica. Any other comments or recommendations regarding how we might ensure equity throughout the funding application process and after the funding awards are made? Jessica added, do not make it reimbursement funding structure. Small agencies cannot thrive in that model. Allow 20% for indirect, consider 25% direct for organizations under $1 million. And Sharon agrees, says, yes, Jessica, 100%. Thank you. Anna has also added to the Sharon summed it up well. Sharon? Yeah, just to quickly add, I just went through a program with the county. Jessica, I, I'm so glad that you brought that up. And they advanced us percent on our contract. And that was a huge help. And we got a reimbursement every month. And so we were ahead of the game. And it was really wonderful. Some of the partners might be on here that are a part of our cohort. Um, but that really was a successful model. Thank you, Sharon. Any other comments or recommendations? Thank you, everyone. Okay, well, that um, concludes our uh, questions uh, for this evening's listening session. Uh, myself and the team will uh, stay back for a while to uh, hear any additional feedback or recommendations that folks would like to give. Again, thank you so much. You can also put uh, your information um, in the chat. You can put your uh, recommendations in the chat. Again, we will be staying on um, if anybody would like to stay on and give additional recommendations. Thank you. Erin posted in the chat, thank you for your time and the invite. Have a wonderful night. And then her contact information, I'm going to spell this out. So please be patient with me. It's Sharon Senegal. And the, yeah, the, and her email address is R as in Robert, H-O-U-S as in Sam, E, F as in Frank, O-U-N as in Nancy, D-A-T-I-O-N. So all together, that's our house foundation at gmail.com. And the website is www.reentrykeys.com. That's R as in Robert, E-E-N as in Nancy, T-R-Y-K-E-Y-S.com. Jessica adds, uh, for equity, please measure meaningful program outcomes, not just inputs. Include program measures that ensure equity goals are met. Thanks, everyone. Such great input. 
Jessica, if if you wouldn't mind getting on the mic and talking a little more about that, I, I would love to hear you um, expand upon that. I am just going to finish up with a couple of other comments in the chat. Um, Ms. Joanne Russell, uh, use the stats for each disparity we are working to address. So this will show issues impacting African Americans and others. Make sure the cultural delivery ability is there with each agency. Provide technical assistance and hands-on support for administrative du duties for tracking and reporting. May want to consider a grant for this kind of technical assistance. Derek says, thank you, everyone. Derek at Project Joy. Actually, I'm going to extend my invitation to Jessica one more time before I start spelling out Derek's contact information. I will do that. I don't see her on anymore. Oh, all right. So. Okay, here we go. Uh, so Derek at Project Joy, he says, collaboration is key. Feel free to reach out. D, as in Derek, Gordon. G O R D O N at projectjoyusa.com. That's P R O J E C T J O Y U S A.com. Barbara Fant says, Thank you so much for the information and the opportunity. I am Barbara Fant with Street Poets. My email is Barbara. B as in Barbara, A-R-B-A-R-A -A -A, at streetpoetsinc.com. That is S-T-R-E-E-T-P-O-E-T-S -E -E as in Sam, I-N-C.com. Website is H-T-T-P-S. So not just HTTP, but HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash streetpoetsinc.com. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Rebecca. So again, thank you for joining us. That does conclude our presentation. We will stay on uh, for a few minutes. Uh, to get any more feedback or recommendations that anybody would like to give. Please feel free to raise your hand or put it in the chat. I have contact information for Joanne Russell, Russell of Let's Make It Happen, a social change and research org. The email address is joannemr2, so that is J O A. N as in Nancy, N as in Nancy, E, M as in Mary, R as in Robert, and then the number two, Joanne, MR2 at gmail.com. Joanne adds, more than glad to assist with admin TA, uh, technical assistance and capacity building. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you. I see that Oscar Benitez and Kenneth Lopez uh, just joined us. If you would like to give any comment or feedback on youth centers, um, gaps in services uh, regarding youth and after school programming, what's working, what's not working. I will also post the electronic survey in the chat again, if that's helpful. Thank you, Rebecca.
Joanne Russell posts in the chat. I did share at our community meeting that Amity is hosting these listening sessions. Thank you so much, Joanne, for doing that. Uh, Oscar Benitez says, I have no questions or feedback at this time. Was looking to learn to help inform future work for the Department of Youth Development. Um, Oscar, I believe a recording of this session will be available. Is that correct? Through the Amity website. So you will be able to, to get it there. Yes, we'll be posting all our listening sessions on the Amity website. Um, you can go back and watch them. And also we will be having one additional listening session on May 11th um, from five to seven, uh, which will be covering all eight of these subject matter areas. Again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us. Uh, we'll give everyone two more minutes to make comment or recommendations. Either raise your hand or you can put it in the chat. Thank you. Joanne Russell says in the chat, thank you for your efforts. We'll be sure to promote the May 11th listening session. Thank you, Joanne. We appreciate you. Thank you, Joanne. All right. Well, that concludes our listening session. Thank you, everybody, for joining us tonight and participating. And hope you have a great evening. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye.